It's time for the VolQuest podcast, where we dissect the biggest news items of the week. Good Tuesday, everybody, and welcome into the VolQuest podcast. I'm Eric Kane, along with Brent Hubs, Austin Price, Rob Lewis. Tennessee coming off a 40-13 to win on the Bayou. Tennessee now 5-0 and on the season, 2-0 and in SEC play, handing LSU its second loss of the season, first in conference play. Appreciate you guys hanging out with us here today. Of course, if you are not a member of our on three ball quest sites, $1 for one year, I get it while it is hot right now. And as always, please subscribe and hit the like button. If you're watching this on YouTube, ball quest is always on YouTube as well. A uh, guy's big win for Tennessee. It just kind of continues to uh, amp up the anticipation for Tennessee and Alabama. But looking back at LSU, uh, all three phases contributed in a big way. Austin, you called it the most complete game of the Josh Heupel era. A lot to celebrate uh, for Tennessee in that 40-13 to 13 win. Yeah, they just won in every phase. You know, and, and you go back and you watch it again. And, you know, I mean, Tennessee's defensive line was just very disruptive. Tennessee's offensive line uh, did a great job against the LSU front. And, uh, I mean, you know, credit Dane Davis and J.J. Crawford coming in and Really being good uh, with run blocking with Tennessee 263 on the ground. Um, but, you know, just overall, they, they played well and stepped up. And and that's the kind of the theme of this team, uh, Rob, is, you know, no matter what happens, no matter who kind of misses a game or a series or whatever, the guys behind them keep stepping up. Yeah, I know they love to say next man up mentality and all that stuff. Now let the coach speak. But, like, it's kind of playing out that way. Yeah, I mean, just look at Tennessee – you know, the last couple of games, I mean, you don't have Gerald Nitsy on Saturday. Crawford comes in, kind of a makeshift offensive line, and you just pound the ball down LSU's throat. You're missing what might be the – probably, to me, the most productive receiver in the SEC in Tillman and Brew McCoy in, you know, the two SEC games that Tillman's missed has gone 100-plus yards receiving in both games. It's uh, – there's a lot of impressive things to me about this team, but the way they show up ready to play is – really jumps out at me and you know first quarter at Pitt is, is probably the lone exception but they've had two big games you know bitter rival against Florida at home on the road at a tricky spot at LSU and and they were they were ready to go I mean just out of the gate yeah I mean I, I'm I'm with Rob I, I the, the confidence this team plays with the confidence they have to start a game I mean they are in attack mode from the get-go I mean you you feel like the opponent's chasing them um, and, and, you know, I, I think that's a credit to Josh Heupel and his coaching staff, the way they go about business. I mean, they're just ready to go from, from the opening kick. It doesn't always go perfect, but it's just like the Florida game, right? They get, they get a fourth down stop and then they drive the length of the field. Now they fumbled it, but, but they were ready to play. There, there's no, there's no real feeling out Eric where, where you're trying to, okay, let's see what they're going to do to us or, or let's see how we're going to play this. It's, look, we're going to go roll our best stuff out there. You see if you can stop it. I think Tennessee and the players really feed off that and play with a lot of confidence. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, Tennessee offensively is going to do what Tennessee does offensively. It doesn't matter if you're playing Alabama, Georgia, Missouri, LSU on the road, or Akron. You're going to go out there and you're going to you're going to let it rip. You're going to throw it down the field. You're going to try to get that run game going. I mean, that is Tennessee's M.O., especially with Hendon Hooker. Uh, now, you know, it's it's easier to do that when you're spotted a couple points to begin this football game. And that's kind of, you know, Rob, my uh, one of my big takeaways is it's a phase that's not sexy. It's a phase that nobody ever talks about. But special teams um, is the reason Tennessee got off to such a hot start to begin this football game. And could have been the reason they won this football game when you sit back and think about it. Uh, we're gifted a muffed kickoff return. Will Brooks, what a play. I mean, you know, Josh Hoppe kind of broke it down and it's a play you often take for granted, but you're running down the side of the field. The guy muffs it. You get the football. You get it inbound. You get clocked. You hang on to the football. Tennessee catches in with a touchdown. Uh, Tennessee's defense makes a stop. You get a 58-yard punt return from D. Williams, and that sets up Tennessee to get points out of that drive. Uh, Chase McGrath, four or five kicking field goals. Paxson Brooks had a punt it inside the, uh, down inside the five-yard line. Tennessee's special teams were really good on Saturday, and that's a unit top to bottom that's been a little iffy at times this season. Yeah, and that I mean that kind of leads me to another point. I asked and I asked Coach Heupel about this today. I mean, special teams against Pittsburgh, you know, nearly cost you the game, and you know, onside kick against Florida that you, that you didn't cover. So, like you said, they've been a little iffy. I, I think pretty clearly that was a point of emphasis in, in, in the bye week, and you, you saw, you know, what the result of that. And then same thing 
they were terrible in the four minute drill against Florida. I mean, in, injected some drama into that game that was completely unnecessary in, in the last 10 minutes because they couldn't keep the chains moving. They get stuck in that same situation at LSU with 11, a little over 11 minutes left and on their own five, no less, after, you know, penalty on the kickoff and go 80, roughly 80 yards in, in 12 plays with 11 runs. And I just, that, to me, that's a sign of a really good team, a really good staff, that areas that are definite weak spots, you know, early in the season get get better. They improve on them as the season goes on. I think you can see that in several levels. Pass rush, an, another one. I mean, I think you could, you could point to a lot of different aspects of this team that weren't where you thought they would be or weren't where you think they should be early. And now five games in, you can see those same areas that I would even call strengths. Yeah, no doubt. And defensively as well. I mean, you go out there and you get a you make a stop on the first drive for um LSU, start building some confidence, already have a 7-0 lead, you know, behind you. And then, you know, the offense continues to do what it does. And I just thought Austin, the, the defense, what a bounce back effort. I mean, it's never going to be perfect, but an LSU couldn't run the football whatsoever. Plus, it was in a situation where you had to throw the football because you were down from the get-go. Uh, you gave up 300 yards through the air, but still no big plays. Both of LSU scoring drives. What was it 13 plays, 96 yards, 12 plays, 75 yards? Defense, what a bounce back effort. Of course, we've spoke on the defensive line and how good that was, but for the guys in the secondary as well. Yeah, uh, this week I think that will be, you know, need to be the same thing. Tennessee can't allow Alabama to hit big plays on them. So, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, Alabama is going to hit some plays, but you can't allow it to be, you know, Milrow for 60 and, you know, they, they get it to, you know, you know, Jameer Gibbs and he goes 74 and, and those type of things like Tennessee needs to make them drive the field. Can they do that? Um, Cause they did it against LSU. Now LSU offensively is not Alabama, not even close, but uh, you know, at the same time, like LSU didn't get any cheapies, you know, they got, you know, they, anything they got, they earned and they didn't get a whole lot. And, and a lot of that goes to credit to the defensive line for stopping their ability to run. And uh, you know, Tennessee secondary, I mean, Played much better against LSU than it did against Florida. I still go back. I think that Florida thing was all scheme. For whatever reason, they allowed, you know, 68 yards a pad on, on every throw. Um, it was not that bad for LSU. I mean, LSU did complete some balls and you know, moved the ball some. But I thought on the whole, the secondary held up uh, pretty well. Yeah, I mean, listen, the, the, the reality is with this defense, the way they play, if they play their true style, they're going to give up some yards between the 30s. I mean, that's just – that's a little bit of that NFL style. It's okay there. And, and then, you know, it's keep them out of field goal range. It's a little bit of bend and, and don't break type deal from time to time. When you got an opportunity to get off the field, you got to take advantage of it. Tennessee was better in third downs th this past week defensively. They gave up a couple early. I, I think the biggest – to me, one of the biggest stats um, th that I'll be th – that I think you can watch for this game Saturday against Alabama, that's missed tackles in the secondary. Tennessee had nine missed tackles, according to PFF, I think is right, in, in the LSU game. That's not – I mean, you're going to have to tackle better in, in the secondary because uh, Alabama's going to try to hit guys on the run, and, and you better not miss because if you miss, then that can be a touchdown. A&M saw that happen to them. Arkansas saw it happen to them. So when you get an opportunity to make a tackle, you better hang on and make that tackle. Tennessee missed a few too many of those in the back end. But overall – uh, a, a much better defensive game for Tennessee. And I, listen, I like I like what Tim Banks did, Rob. He, he he saw Joshua Joseph get that stunt and get home on the sack. And he said, hey, you know what? I'm going to dial that puppy up every third down I can get. And, and they rode that horse to success all day long. Yeah, and this is kind of with the defense. And, and Coach Heifel's talked about it. It's not exactly a mystery. But LSU going 0 for 3 on fourth downs was, was huge in the game. And Tennessee, Tennessee converted three of their own which had an enormous impact. And Hubbard, I mean, we saw, we saw it against Florida, and we've seen it against LSU. Don't you think – I mean, Tennessee's playing so well on offense right now, the way Hypo plays, they're getting other coaches out of their comfort zone. And, oh, you know, I making... Yeah. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that, Rob. And, and I think it's more evident on the opening drive that Florida had and, and more evident with the, the second or the third drive that LSU had. Look, the, the, the end of the half, four down <laughs> – that's just a boneheaded play call. That, that that I don't care what you think of the other team's offense. That's just not smart football. But when you look at those opening drives, here Florida takes the football to try to get, you know, try to 
to get to set a tone and, and get things going. They get they get in field goal range. They're afraid to take the three point lead because they because it's not enough points, right? You got you got to outscore them. Like in, in in most teams, a lot of a lot of teams in years past would have been let's kick the field goal. We get a three point lead. We get settled into the game, right? Florida elected not to do that. Tennessee takes advantage or try to take advantage of. It. They fumbled the, you know, on that next drive, but Tennessee got to stop. Then in the LSU game was the score 10 nothing and LSU's in field goal range with a chance to cut it to a one score yes. game. Yes. And, yes. and and he go he goes for it there because he's like, I gotta have seven because because we can't get any further behind. Um, yeah, and Rob, I think absolutely it's getting coaches out of their comfort zone, which is a little crazy because of Tennessee's fast pace, you're gonna get a bunch of possessions. I mean, I mean, how many possessions did LSU have in that game? 13, 12, 13 possessions, something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what Tennessee destroying the clock in the fourth quarter. So, um, I, I don't, yeah, I, I, think ten, I think Tennessee's offensive prowess is absolutely causing the head coaches to do some things. And I think the fourth quarter thing is is has become a little bit out of control in, in football. I mean, the Chargers on Sunday go for fourth down at midfield against the Browns, miss it. Browns drive down and miss the game-winning field goal. And, and, and I'm sure that – if you ask Brandon Staley that, that there was some analytic in the folder somewhere that said you're supposed to do that. Well, he's always been move. about that. Yeah, just just kick the ball and, and go play defense. And, and I think coaches are – I think they're a little out of whack on fourth downs. But I think Josh Heupel is getting some guys really out of whack as well with this offense. Well, Brandon Staley lost two football games last year because of his own stu- stupidity of fourth downs and when to go for it and all that. So that, that's a staple for him to begin with. But – I uh, I think that uh, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Just the way this offense operates, and it's affecting the the way the play callers doing things on the other side. Now, uh, a big reason for the way Tennessee had success. Another big reason uh, was Tennessee's run game. Tennessee ran all over LSU, a team that was giving up on average 109 yards per game. 272 yards were gained from the line of scrimmage, netted 263. Jabari Small, Brent, you said this on the Rocky Top Rewind, which if you're listening or watching right now and you have not. Uh, checked out the Rocky Top Rewind. Leonard Little was fantastic. Uh, go ahead and check that out as well. But Brent, you said, hey, Jabari Small looks like a different guy coming back from his later shoulder bug, right? And, and he has. He ran tough against Florida. He ran tough against LSU. Got a couple of long runs. Turf Monster got him one time. He, he could have got about 20 or 30 more yards. But uh, Jabari Small He would have went over 200 good. if that had not happened. Does it say what? <laughs> He'd have been over 200 yards if yeah. he hadn't got tripped up. I mean, he was – he was he was really good, man. You go back to the halftime from halftime of Florida on. How how much this has been Jabari that were you know Tennessee fans and the media are used to seeing. First part of the season, you know, hampered, slowed a little bit, and then really at halftime of Florida on. He the last six quarters, he's been really good and didn't necessarily need Hendon Hooker. He still ran for about sixty yards, and sure, that's good. Yeah. And you know that's going to be needed in this offense, but didn't need Hendon Hooker to you know, play Superman and get out there and run the football. That's always good for this offense, Brent. And that was evident against LSU. Yeah. I mean, I think the long run in the third to, to start the second half against Florida may, may have got Jabari going a little bit, uh, but Jabari got going in this game uh, in a large way, Rob, because of that offensive front. Um, I mean, listen, Rodney Garner's group played well, but that's a makeshift at LSU offensive line. They've got freshmen out there. They got guys out of position. They're they're down basically three starters. Tennessee took full advantage of that. That's an LSU defensive front that had been really stout against the run, and they got shoved. I mean, they got shoved around a lot. That that's as well as Glenn and as physical as Glenn Ellerby's group has played uh, with that kind of success. I, I was of all the things to take away from the game. That, that was the most impressive to me, Rob, was that offensive line. Yeah, so I couldn't agree more. And it was what it was exactly what you want. I mean, so often, you know, the, the creases were there. Backs were, you know, almost to the second level before they were having to make a decision on, on what to do. I mean, average right at five and a half yards a carry. And again, like, like I said earlier, the most impressive thing to me about the ground game was when LSU knew it was coming, when they loaded the box, Tennessee, I mean, they still ran it down their throat been a while since Tennessee's done that you know and again I mean LSU's will was broken on that last drive but you still got to go out there and do it um and and Tennessee coming off their own goal line goes 11 runs and 12 plays just the one pass to Princeton Fant um that that's that's a little old school there breaking somebody's will and and I know Josh Heupel enjoyed that one Austin 
no doubt. Well, especially when they weren't able to do that uh, against Florida. And, and credit, credit to Princeton fan. I thought Eric in the press box, he had a couple of you know after you know having a couple of drops early in the year and then the fumble against Florida, he had a couple of nice hard catches Saturday on some third down pickups. Uh, the squirrel white catch that picked up a first down, which was like like a one and a half yard pass, but it was still really impressive. But I mean, Princeton did the same thing a couple of times. And, uh, you know, I, I thought, you know, on the whole, Tennessee really was able to kind of establish their will. I thought the LSU fans will was broken at halftime when, when Kelly elected to go for it and then Tennessee turned it into three. It, it, a lot of those, uh, like I think the locker rooms will might have been broken. Yeah, I agree. But like the lower bowl, like yeah, they the yellow them. padded seats, like they didn't come back. It was like, yeah. forget going for a coke. We're, we're just <laughs> yeah. getting out of here. Like yeah. you know, I mean, like they, they gave up. Yeah, they did. And and I'll say this too for for the short yardage and some of the third down stuff. I I, I like the creativity, Rob, that Alex Golish and Josh Heupel brought in those plays. I mean. It was not on, and even on that long drive, it was not slam your head into the guard gap and see what happens. No, and I mean, how nifty was the, the shovel pass to Fan on, on third down? I mean, great call. I mean, AP just referenced the little, the little squirrel white, you know, third down conversion where they motioned him and then have the little short pass. And yeah, I mean, I thought they they had LSU on their heels all day long. And I mean, we talk about it all the time. Like Josh Heupel can can scheme people open. How, I mean, is, has anybody been more wide open this year when, than Brew McCoy was there? And, That's two games that, in a row. That's almost like the same throw. Just really impressive. I, 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 I can't find a meme for it anywhere, but the way Heifel's coaching right now, Hover, remember in 10 Cup when, when Renee, when Renee he, he's hitting like maybe a seventh one into the pond on 18, and Renee Russo turns to the other girl and is like, oh, I've never been with a guy who goes for it before. <laughs> And that's where that's where Tennessee fans are right now. I mean, they've got a guy that, that go and he goes for the jugular. Pretty good analogy. Yeah, it, it, it is. That I was mean, for it, you, AP. It, it Golf is. and movies. <laughs> it, it, it's exactly what he is, and I think that that's what has Tennessee fans so excited because it's like, wait a minute, we're not we're not going to take what the defense has given us. You know, it's we're going to go create mismatches and create problems. I mean. Look at the, the the end of the half. Now, Hendon Hooker, because he got his absolute insides knocked out of him or knocked loose there. But, Go ahead. I was going say, I bet that was a teaching moment for Dylan Sampson in the film room. <laughs> yeah. That was a teaching moment on the sideline because I'm not sure Dylan Sampson returned to the game I don't after think he that. Did. And it was um, so bad, too, because Hooker on Monday said, hey, I saw that safety. I just thought he was going to be taken care of. Nope. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, that was obviously a bust. But if, if – Hooker doesn't lose his accuracy and, and you know, um, ha- have to get his breath back for whatever at the half that he had to do. Look at what they did after the fourth down failure by, by Brian Kelly. I mean, Princeton fan is wide open in the middle of the football field. I mean, the most safeties were outside the hash before the ball was snapped, and the middle of the field was the great divide. The previous play before that, they got Jalen Hyatt down the sideline – wide open and I hooker missed both of those but I mean if you're LSU there's 30 seconds to go in the half right or 40 seconds to go in the half aren't you guarding against a big play yet there's two schematically Josh Heupel and Alex Golish got two guys completely wide open against what should be soft coverage at that point in the game of where they were just a credit to what they do schematically yeah I mean I noticed a lot of that on the rewatch Brent and I was texting you about it I mean so many times they got they found the mismatch in man coverage and they exploited it like that Utah pass taken small out there the linebacker follows Utah underneath that Jalen Hyatt uh you know touchdown the safety <laughs> took safety out of play right there and you just depend on Hyatt just to win with his wheels and that's what he did uh, really really impressive and again, they continue to utilize these tight ends in different spots too. So it looked good. Now you're going to need all that. And then some, of course, against Alabama, uh, the number three team in the AP poll, number one in the coaches poll coming to town again, much like Florida stage is set college game day. This time you'll have sec nation as well. Sold out. It's going to be an orange out CBS three thirty kick, all that and more. And, and the biggest question entering this football game is the injuries. Of course, what about Cedric Tillman as the week goes on? And we, we've touched on that. Uh, Gerald Mincy, the offensive tackle appears like he's going to be ready to roll for Tennessee. Of course, we'll have to see about the Jalen McCullough situation, but obviously for Alabama, reigning Heisman Trophy winning quarterback Bryce Young, and you had Nick Saban, who was quoted on Monday about the injury, quotes, we're trying to uh, get him ready to play this week, but nobody can predict how quickly this is going to give him an opportunity 
to be able to go out and do what he needs to do. So Bryce Young, potentially. Uh, Milrow, the backup quarterback. Ty Simpson's also on that roster. Um, Alabama's going to have to juggle some things if Young can't go, but obviously still a very talented team. Brent Hubs, Alabama coming to town. Well, I mean, I think that the comments from Nick Saban are are, um, are interesting because you know where is where is exactly what is the shoulder injury exactly? What 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 are they looking like there? Um, it's to my understanding that that he didn't he didn't throw any warm up passes on the field pregame against Texas A and M. Um, supposedly did something in a tunnel. Um, I, I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't know. It, it, it's that's intriguing. I mean, and I think that makes for a challenge for Josh Heupel and Tim Banks in terms of what you're preparing for, because now you're having to prepare for a lot, right? You, you know, you know what Bryce Young can do if he's healthy. Um, if they go with the, the backup that played against Texas A&M, that's a vastly different offense because he is a tuck it and run kind of guy. And he is a load to bring down. And then Ty Simpson's hanging out there who can throw it, but you haven't seen him enough to have a real, book on what he likes to do as well so um challenging week for Tennessee defensively because they're going to play certainly they're going to play Bryce Young differently than they're going to play the the backup quarterback that we saw play against Texas A&M so you almost got to prepare somewhat two different plans for your front seven in this game don't you yeah I think so I mean I think you you have to you know be ready uh in case Bryce plays but I think if Bryce can go he is going to be – and I know it's it's hard to say, well, you know, you can't just coach out, you know, trying to make a play, right? But, I mean, like, you don't think, like, that he's going to be – have it driven into him. Like, look, if it's not there, just throw it away. we got to have you for the rest of the year. Like, him trying to get out there and make a play like he did at Texas. I'm not saying, like, in game crunch time he wouldn't do that. But, like, throughout the game, I just don't know how much he's going to be looking to get out there and make plays with his legs. Because when you get past that line of scrimmage, you tee yourself up to just get hit. And, and that's how you end up re-injuring it even more and more and more. Um, you know, Nick's comments, they were very, uh, uh, very much, uh, to me, that left a lot to kind of the imagination. Like it didn't. The way it didn't I really interpret it, 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 like from that comment right there, it's one quote, it's a Monday and everything. But the way I interpreted that was like, this guy does not look like he's ready to play right now. Well, yeah, if the game was today, yeah. you know, it was, what was Hubs' line for Cedric Tillman going into Florida? If the game was today, but the game's not on Monday. So they've got all week to kind of build up to it and get him ready to play and see if he can go. If if he can't go, I do think it's going to be interesting to see what they do because I think there's a, a path where you possibly see a Ty Simpson in this game just because they know they, they know they didn't have to score a ton to beat Texas A&M, whereas Tennessee offensively is much more difficult to defend. You would expect them to get points. They were able to do, you know, they got 24 last year in Tuscaloosa. Um, and, and that was, you know, to me, not as good an offense as, as this year's team is. So I, I think you're going to have to have a, 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 at least an option to have a throwing quarterback Saturday, which would be tie if Bryce can't play. Yeah, Rob, I mean, if, if it's if you're Alabama and, and say if, if Young can't go, if you're Alabama, I, I'm putting that big boy quarterback out there, Jalen Miller, I'm saying, hey, Tennessee defense, you think you can stop the run? Come and get it. And until that doesn't work, and then maybe you see an influx of a passing quarterback in Ty Simpson. But if Young can't go and I'm Alabama, that's exactly what I'm doing because, you know, I, Tennessee's been really good against the run so far. But it, it, since this regime has been here, I know, albeit it's been a year and a half, struggle with the mobile quarterbacks. That would be my game plan with the two quarterback that lead off with the runner and Milrow. Yeah, but I think that the guys that they have struggled with have also been. I mean, like real dual threats, and I'm not. I don't. I just don't know what kind of a threat Milrow is as a passer right now. I mean, I think you know he's hit some big plays, but it's. I don't think it's something you, you know. You don't worry about it like you would with even Anthony Richardson. You know, I, I don't. I don't. I just don't think he's that polished. I don't, I would bet a lot of money that 24 points is not beating Tennessee on Saturday. Mil Milrow is a modern day Tommy Frazier, though. I mean, like. Well, yeah, he's a better athlete. I mean, he's he, he's big. He's a load. I mean, like I, I'm telling you, whenever they convince him, hey, you're not a quarterback, bud, but you can play a long time in the NFL, playing another position, that guy is going to be. Oh my gosh, tough I conversation mean, because that's where the money is. Yeah, I mean, you, you I mean just watch him on those runs against Arkansas or last week when he got loose. I mean, I don't know if anybody in the league moves like he does. I mean, it's impressive. 
Yeah, Again, he, he's not a quarterback, and when he figures he, that out, he's got a real bright future. Well, he's – I mean, he can certainly run around and, and is a big body. Um, he can throw – I mean, he, he can throw it deep. I mean, you you know, you can't get it – can't give him anything cheap. I wonder this, too, if you're Alabama, if you don't have – if, if, if you don't have Bryce Young, does Alabama try to do something that we haven't seen a lot of other teams do because I think they're trying to chase points and they're worried about matching points? Does Alabama really try to slow the game down? Do they really try to bleed the play clock and really try to keep it a lower possession game, uh, which I think you would see – you would think more teams would do. Um, does Alabama try to do this um, more so than we've seen from some other teams? Like, at one point, I mean, Brian Kelly's trying to go tempo in that game on, on Saturday, and it's like, you know – you probably want to make sure you stay on the field for a while. So does Alabama slow the game down to try to really dominate time of possession and limit possessions by Josh Heupel? Yeah, yeah, maybe so. And, of course, you, you thought that's what the game plan for Kentucky was going to be last year. Then they threw everything out the window and went completely opposite of what they do. But uh, regardless of what Alabama's thought process is offensively, regardless who's under center and all that good stuff, uh, someone that's going to be involved, Rob Lewis, it's going to be Jameer Gibbs. Uh, the leading rusher, the leading receiver, formerly of Georgia Tech. Um, he is a really, really good player, much not to Will Anderson Jr. status on defense, obviously, but Tennessee's defense will have to know exactly where Jameer Gibbs is lined up every single play because he's their best player, no doubt about it. Uh, and you talk about – AP was just talking about Milro being fast. I mean, man, Gibbs can fly, and he's got that, you know, that short-range acceleration and burst that really – you know, you think nothing's there, and you know, bam! It's like the guy, you know, is escaped from a phone booth, and that's one hover where you were talking about missed tackles in the secondary. That's a guy that, I mean, you need to if you get a chance, you need to get him on the ground. Yeah, but, yeah, he's a house, he's a house call if you miss a tackle. I mean, he he's you're not going to catch him. Uh, I, I think the other thing too that'll be uh, challenging is how much do they try to incorporate him into the pass game in the flats and really try to stress the, the, the linebackers that way. LSU got Tennessee, I guess, twice with the tailback in the flat uh, early in that game. Um, so how much does Alabama go with, with that? Because that seems to be a, um, that seems to be a player in the pat that running back in the passing game seems to be something that's hard for defenses to defend right now with the way the game is being played. I mean, take uh, take a third down LSU had early in the first quarter on uh, – heck, it might have been the opening drive. I can't remember. Um, and, and I turned to Austin in the press box. I said, Juwan Mitchell's got to push there. You got trips to one side, the skinny slot, the inside slot guy, just runs a simple out. And the and the, um, the the middle linebacker is, you know, in zone coverage. That number three is your guy right there, and you're just not pushed out far enough. If you get Gibbs in that mismatch right there, that's, uh, that's going to be difficult for those linebackers, Brent, who are stretched, uh, you know, to make athletic plays. Yeah, no doubt. And, and I think teams are going to continue to try to do that. They're going to try to stretch the linebackers, you know, um, with that way because they've got so much on their plate with RPOs. you got to get in the box and defend the run. Everybody's playing the four two five. You can run guys deep, you know, and, and create some some space, you know, underneath. And um, I think that's why you always you, – you see a lot of running backs open in the flat. I think it's a real hard challenge for the linebackers to get there. I would imagine – Bill O'Brien in Alabama would want to try to attack Tennessee uh, in that way because I think I think Gibbs is pretty good uh, with his hands catching the ball out of the backfield. Well, Hendon Hooker acknowledged this Austin on Monday, but I mean this is not this isn't rocket science when you watch Alabama play defense. You're going to be looking around for where's number thirty-one, where's number thirty-one. Oh, there he is, there he is, there he is. Hendon Hooker is going to have to find out where Will Anderson Jr. is every single snap. Um, I think he's the best player in college, and um, he, he can do a whole lot. He'll line up in different spots. Of course, he leads Alabama in sacks and TFLs. He had just an incredible year last year, of course, but that's going to be the impact player. Um, it was good to see Tennessee's, uh, you know, Darnell Wright handle B.J. Ojolari the way he did against LSU. But, um, you know, if it's Joe Mincy, if it's J.J. Crawford, Dane Davis, or Darnell Wright, he'll be moving around a little bit, and that's the that's the key to their defense right there is finding him and, and trying to slow him down. Yeah, and – you know, you know, you're right. I thought, you know, a, a good warm up to Will Anderson is BJ Ojolari, but BJ Ojolari is not no Will doubt. Anderson. And and Will Anderson, as Hypo talked about on Monday, is really good against the run. Everybody knows him for getting to the quarterback, but he's still really good against the run. And and you gotta know where he's at. Dallas Turner on the other side just as good. 
I mean, well, not as good. He's not as good, but just just, just as dangerous. Better watch um, out for him. You know, to, to get home and make plays. So, um, you know, this Alabama team is you know, going to rely on their defense. I, I think they'll take it upon themselves, um, you know, to, to try to make some big plays early and try to set the tone because, you know, even if Bryce is healthy enough to play, he's still not going to be 100%. So, you know, I think the defense will be motivated to try to go out and, and do their part early in this football game, which is why Tennessee, again, has been so good at not turning the football over. They've got to continue that trend because as long as they don't turn it over, I think they're going to be able to score on just about anybody. And then it boils down to how many stops can the defense get? Can they bend, not break, and, and you know, and force field goals over touchdowns? And, you know, can you not turn the football over and give your opponent short fields? Yeah, Tennessee got lucky. They fumbled the football three times on Saturday. They did not lose any of the three. They've got to make sure that they're, you know, c- controlling the football. I mean, Jalen Wright fumbled one out of bounds. Obviously, Hooker uh, had the ball knocked loose on the big hit. Dylan Sampson picked that up. The, the one thing about Will Anderson, Rob, that's different than B.J. Olajari is you knew where B.J. was every play. I know I messed up his last name. Sorry. <laughs> um, you, 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 know, you know that you knew where he was going to be every play. With Will Anderson, you don't know where he's going to be every play, which is a total different challenge. Yeah, and if you watch NFL, I mean, he remind, the way they use him reminds me of Micah Parsons with, with Dallas. I mean, he's so disruptive. And uh, I'm going to get in the way back machine. And uh, Buddy Ron said this. I'm pretty sure he said it about Reggie White. Um, he asked Buddy. He asked, Buddy Ron was asked about why do you move Reggie White around, you know, so much during on, on the line during the game. He's like, well, would you rather scare the hell out of one guy or scare the hell out of a bunch of people? And, and that's what they do with Will. I mean, you just don't know. I mean, he's he can stand up. I mean, he can come off the edge. And, you know, I don't want to make him into Superman, but I'm with Eric. I think he's the best college football player in the country right now. Tell you what, it's not a dirty play. It is a legal hit. Cut block. That'll be your best friend. If you're dealing Samson, Jabari Small, Jalen Wright, cut block. You, you see him coming off the edge, cut block. Um, if you don't do it downfield, it's not a penalty. So that's uh, that might be your best friend there. At least that was the norm in college football a couple of years ago. They'll probably flag it nowadays. Um, Austin, if Tennessee wins, you kind of started down this road a moment ago, but if Tennessee is going to pull off this upset, Tennessee needs to do what efficiently and something, what needs to happen for Tennessee to pull off this win? Believe. I mean, I really, if they keep playing the way they've been playing, they can win this game. Um, but I think a lot of it just goes into belief and, and, you know, hype's done a good job of, of building the belief system, um, from a pure football standpoint, I think it just comes down to turnovers. Not allowing your opponent like Alabama to have cheap ones. We talked about that against Florida. Maybe not as much against LSU, but just from a standpoint of like, don't don't get behind the eight ball early. Don't give them a short field and allow them to get some momentum. You know, Alabama's good enough on their own. Don't make it easier for them. And um, and if Tennessee somehow were to find a way to be ahead at the end of this football game, oh, Hubs, you ain't gonna make it down from the press box. All of our lives are in danger on the field, and uh, Neyland may crumble. It'll be it would be a show for sure. For for me, I, I think defensively, it's all about tackling, particularly tackling in space, and then offensively, don't miss an opportunity. If they bust in the secondary and leave a guy open, can't overthrow him. And, and I think Hendon Hooker's done a great job of that. You know, when they're they they haven't had many misses on on wide open plays or, or quote touchdown plays. Um, you just can't miss when, when you get that opportunity because you don't know how many they're going to give you. So when it's there, you scheme something up, Rob, and it's wide open, you better connect on it in this game. Yeah, and for me, I mean, depend, if, if Milrose is your quarterback, it's to me the biggest key is run defense. Make that kid beat you with his arm because I, I don't think he can. If they defend the run like they did last week um, and Young's not playing, I mean, I, I think it's all Tennessee. Uh, on the other side of the ball, it's simple. Just run the football effectively. I mean, I, I'll, I would wager to say if Tennessee averages five plus yards a carry against anybody, they, they win that football game. Because I, mean, I just think if you're that means they're moving the sticks, the tempo is coming into play, and the entire playbook is is at your disposal with, with a trigger man that that knows what to do with it. I echo all those things you guys just said, but also in a game like this, when you're an underdog, when you're playing against arguably the best team in the country. The Alabamas, the Georgias, yada, yada. 12 penalties for 107 yards will get you beat. Plain and simple. The little things like that. Don't miss wide open receivers. Don't penalize yourself. 
you can't, I mean, you got to be disciplined in a football game like this. Not only a big time football game for Tennessee, this program on the field against Alabama, but also in the land of recruiting. Florida was a massive recruiting weekend. Awesome price setting up to be uh, just like that this weekend. Yeah. I, you know, again, college football world, all the eyes will be right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. That includes a lot of recruits and uh, you know, Tennessee is going to, host a couple of official visitors. Um, you know, they're also going to, you know, have a bunch of unofficials in. David Hobbs coming back in unofficially. Tamarion Parker unofficially. You know, I think there'll be more big names that come this weekend. Um, you know, big game, big names. And and and, and, I, and I think Tennessee fans will be, um, you know, happy to see all the, the talent that will be here because I do think that there will be some names where you're like, whoa, you know, uh, potentially uh, here Saturday and then a bunch of 24s and 25s. I mean, you know, you know, if, if you're not here, like, why, why are you not here? Like, I mean, this is a perfect, you know, scenario for, for Josh Heifel and company to continue to build momentum and recruiting. Um, you know, we'll see who else makes it in. Does Elijah Davis, Juco D Lyman make it in, you know, um, you know, Tennessee's going to, you know, have, you know, a couple of Juco's I think here on, that are defensive linemen. Uh, this weekend, but you know, he's one that I know they'd like to try to get up here. We'll see if he makes it in. And so, you know, th- this is a situation where Tennessee continues to build and build momentum in recruiting. And you look at the, the recruiting class, it's got a ton of players already in it. But, hey, when you can sign as many as you want, as long as you're under the 85, why not, right? Because, I mean, you're bound to have some defections at the end of the football season. Yeah, I think the challenge for recruiting this week is you don't have an unlimited amount of tickets, Okay. Everybody can't come that that wants to come. So you gotta you gotta prioritize. You gotta be careful that you're not turning somebody away that's gonna offend them later on if it are a 24 or 25. So you gotta make the right decisions there. I think the other thing too is everybody wants to come to this game. So you gotta make sure you're not just letting guys come that really don't have any interest in you. They just want to come to the big you know the big atmosphere and a big foot and, and a big football game. So. Um, Listen, they're not going to turn hundreds away. I'm not. I'm not meaning that. But Austin, you're trying to manage a number, which is and it's a good problem to have because you probably got more people want to come to this game than you got seats for in the recruiting world. Well, they do a good job of of kind of weighing, you know, what's real and what's not. I mean, there were some yeah. kids that wanted to come to that Florida game, but Tennessee knew they weren't really an option, and Florida was more the team they were coming to see. So why? Why? Yeah. why you know, that's my point. And, and so they, they they those kids, you know, were turned away, turned down. And, and schools do that every week. They do that every week because sometimes, you know, there are kids that just want to hop. I mean, you think Jordan Matthews was sitting in the recruiting section? <laughs> no, LSU wasn't letting that kid come sit in the recruiting section amongst a bunch of their LSU recruits. You know, I mean, there's a reason for that. So, um, you know, you look at the two official visitors, Samuel and Pimba, the uh, IMG product, defensive lineman. Everybody's got him pegged for Georgia, but, you know, this kind of weekend, atmosphere, be able to hang around the players. You never know. You never know. And then Keldrick yeah. Falk, the other one, again, one that you know has been up here a bunch. Um, I, I, I keep using the word forced. I mean, maybe that's not the right word. It just seems it, it just something seems off there, and it always has. He didn't put Tennessee in the top five. Then they talked him into coming to the Memorial Day thing. Then he acted like, well, I just forgot. Yeah, you guys are in there. But then when he chose. Florida State, it, he didn't have Tennessee in the, the list of teams then either. Um, has since come back up here with his cousin, who's a 24 or 25, um, you know, for the game a few weeks ago. Coming back in this weekend, he's clearly looking around. He's not married to Florida State. Um, you know, can Tennessee, you know, get him in there? He's got a younger brother that's a really good player too. But, uh, you know, this is a situation where Tennessee – you know, needs defensive linemen, and, you know, they're going to recruit them all, bring them all in. It's a big week. Big week for Tennessee. It's a big week for uh, Tennessee fans. Number three, Alabama coming to town. The stage is set once again. College game day, SEC Nation, CBS, 330. Sold out crowd here. They're doing an orange out. Uh, It's going to be a big show. The entire college football landscape is going to be on Knoxville, all eyes on Knoxville, and uh, hopefully it'll be a really good football game. But, all throughout the week, everything you need to know about Tennessee football, about Alabama, this matchup, plenty of coverage, FalkWest.com, and, of course, always on the General's Quarters. If you haven't subscribed already, literally, what are you waiting on? It cost $1. Check us out. Fill us out. It'll cost $1 for one year. Uh, that deal's not going to last forever, so go ahead and jump on it right now today. And, of course, as always, hit the like button, subscribe to VolQuest on YouTube. 
four just awesome price. I, I was gonna say, just think, Eric. We've only been at on three for about six weeks, man. Six weeks. It feels like we've been there forever. It's just kind yeah. of been like this easy transition. Six weeks. Balls are undefeated since we made the move over, and uh, it's been a fun six weeks. So Eric's right. If you if you're not a member, hop in there and, and join us. We have a lot of fun and a lot of interaction with you guys. And you know, Hubs has already promised if Tennessee can get a win Saturday. Yeah, we're going to go outside while Neyland's burning, and he's going to do the Leslie Nielsen, like, nothing to see here. <laughs> As you can see, a lot of fun. Everything's fine. Everything's under control. <laughs> AT, it's all completely I under think, control. I, I think Hubbard wants to pick Tennessee this week. <clears throat> um, I think he does. Uh, <laughs> me, man? This is the same guy that when they were up 27 with two minutes to go was still finding a way on the Vol Network broadcast. To find a way for Tennessee to lose. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. That is not true. See, it's this uh, and a whole lot more. Now, it's one dollar. At the seventeen point lead against Florida, I did I did caution that the game was not over at that point. And sadly, I was I was right. It was, shouldn't have been at that point. Did Did so. you giggle? Did you giggle during the broadcast Saturday? Was it the CP giggle? No, 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 no. Cordell Patterson giggle in that one. I, I'm trying to be a little more professional. He's coming to the game this week. Thing. When you see him, will you giggle? <laughs> hey, the, the, I might. But the, that's the other thing too. The number of former players that yeah. are lining up to come back to this thing is like unbelievable right now. I mean, there are all kinds of guys trying to get back. Um, I mean. Everybody, if if you have any history with with the program, your phone's blowing up right now looking for a ticket because there's a bunch of former players want to get in on this deal and come watch. So it uh, should be just a star-studded weekend for sure. Recruiting, former players, and should be a good football game. Yeah, Brent Hubs will be in that press box. Awesome Price will be in that press box. It's going to be a star-studded affair. Rob <laughs> Lewis and I are just along for the ride. Going to be a big week. Tennessee and Alabama will continue hey. to break it down right here on VolQuest. Appreciate you guys for hanging out with us. We'll have the mail back going up on Thursday. Until then, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday, everybody. You've been listening to the VolQuest podcast every week here on VolQuest.